today for our next installment of our sermon series, The Faith of Jesus in a Pluralistic World, we'll wind together three passages from the Gospel of John to find what I think might be a surprising message in there and a new take on, a, on, an, on an old and well-known uh, verse. But for now, will everybody take a deep breath with me? And let that out. And for this next little while, let us center our attention as we prepare to worship God. Would you stand in body or in spirit as you, we join together in the call to worship this morning? Come, all you people, enter the gate of God's sheep hold. Bold. God will bring all people to be one flock, one shepherd. That they may be one. We envision. Let us now sing our opening hymn, hymn, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is, number 138, verses 1, 2, 3, and 6. And at this time, I will invite all the children to come forward. I'm going to need this. How is everyone today? Oh, lots of friends are here. Uh-oh, I'm trapped. I'm trapped. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Excuse me, Jesse. All right, I'll come down here. How is everyone today? I have a question. What is today? Mother's Day. Oh. It's Mother's Day. Yes. 
I know. It's the best. Okay, hold on one at a time. What'd you say? Mother's Day is the best day for mothers. It's the best day for mothers. It's also the 14th. It's also the 14th. That's true. <laughs> so, did anybody do anything special for their mom today? Um, oh, wait. Now we need the microphone. Hold on. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Spencer. All right, Calvin. I made a present at school and then gave it to my mother. You made a present at school to give to uh, his mom. I made a picture frame with my picture. Oh, nice, Karen. Is that true? Oh, nice. <laughs> you never know. Else? All right, who else? We I made it. my mom breakfast. You made your mom breakfast? I want to come to Excuse your Excuse me. Where was my breakfast? <laughs> All right, well, that's okay. Do you have anything okay. to share, boys? No. Nope. Jesse, yeah, did you do it? Oh, Spencer. I actually made a project out of green construction paper, black markers, paper plates, and staples. Oh, very wow. special project out of a green project. To make, to make a creeper, Minecraft creeper face, and then um, I put it in between two put paper oh, plates that I stapled it. together. Got it. Anybody else do anything special for their mom? I'm my hero. You forgot me. What did you do for your mom this morning? Your mom's. Well, I made two cards for both of them. Well, yes, this is true. He did. And a flower. What? And a hand flower. A hand flower. With your hand. Two presents. Very cute. Cool. Cool. <laughs> so another, so we all, we celebrate our moms, right? Those of us who have moms. But we also today, I think that it's a great day to celebrate God, who is like a mother to us. And a lot of times we only hear people talk about God as father. But guess what? God is like a mother too. And I have a great book to share with you today called Dear Mama God, and I have permission to use this in streaming, Lynn, yes, um, by the author herself, Deneen Akers. This is a brand new book that just came out, and it's all about God as mother. So I wanted to share this with you because I thought it would be a nice thing to do on Mother's Day. Yeah, we're going to read it all together. Maybe Lena can hold those coloring sheets for them that go with it. So Dear Mama God, written by Deneen Akers and illustrated by Jillian Gamble. All right. Oh yeah, that's the, we'll just leave that. So it says, the spirit of God, she has made me and the breath of the nursing God, she gives me life. There's no picture yet. Job 33, 4. So Dear Mama God, thank you for the earth and all living things. Yeah, there's a whale in there. Thank you for rain that makes rainbows. That's right. Can you see? Thank you for seeds that grow into plants. Sunflowers, right? Grown ups, you can look at my book after church if you want. Thank you for trees, for birds to build nests in. Aww. Why do birds build nests? Well, some birds build nests. Puffins do build holes in the rocks. I do know that. I saw them. Thank you for creeks that flow and grow. I actually Thank you for the sun that warms my face. Thank you for hula hoops that dogs can jump through. Can your dogs jump through hula hoops? I don't have a dog. Me neither. <laughs> Me neither. Thank you for kitties that are furry and purry. Kitties. Thank you for paper that I can draw on. Thank you for drawing. Thank you for fires that make me feel cozy. Thank you for beating hearts that love. I don't know if there's an ocean. 
Thank you for stuffies that snuggle with me in bed. You have stuffies in your bed? Jesse has a lot. Thank you for the whole universe that is our home. We do. That's true. Smart kiddos. And most especially, Mama God, thank you for your love that holds me close. So God is a lot like a mama. And so today, we celebrate that. Yes? A parent. There we go. Yeah, but the, we celebrate the motherly features of God today. All right, can we say a prayer together before you go off to Sunday school? Let's repeat after me. We'll say, Dear God, thank you for loving us like a mother. We thank you for all the mothers in our lives. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, y'all have fun at Sunday right, school. Let's go. Okay. Ten minutes? <laughs> okay. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of John. Chapter 10, verses 11 through 18, hear these words. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You pray with me for just a moment. God, may my words reflect your thoughts and may our interpretation of them reflect your will. Amen. So back in 2011, when Mike, my partner Mike and I lived in Wisconsin, the State General Assembly there passed a new law and it was referred to as Act 10. That law dramatically reduced the role of public sector unions in the state. Well, there was a very, very slim majority in the state Senate to pass the bill. The entire state minority physically left the state, thus ensuring that no quorum could be attained and preventing the bill from becoming law. For the next three weeks, protesters filled the Capitol building in Madison and legislatures, legislators worked hard to break the impasse without success. The lower house actually debated for 61 straight hours, trying to find some way out of it. Finally, the remaining Senate majority changed a few rules to bypass the quorum requirement and pass the bill. The governor signed it and it continues to be the law of the land in Wisconsin. Now that's an extreme example, but it's certainly not the only one. There are other very recent examples of how states or nations that are closely divided politically can struggle to find a path forward using democratic processes. We're witnessing that every day. 
Now, I'm not going to stand up here today and tell you how you're supposed to think about politics in Wisconsin 12 years ago. <laughs> but that event and more recent ones have a key concept in common with today's scripture that I want to explore for just a minute. That's the, that's the state legislature in Wisconsin. But here's the concept I want you to explore. Majority rule, right? X plus one is greater than X. That's how it should be, right? Right? I suspect that if, you were, if I were going to do a poll among us here today, all of us would come down in a variety of positions about labor unions. And, I, and also, no doubt, reflect a variety of other positions on all of the other hot button issues of the day. But what I think we can all agree on here, can you advance the slide, please? There it goes. <laughs> I think we can all agree on here is that in a democratic process, when, the major when a majority wins and a minority loses, we need to be aware that some will not get what they want. And if it was really important to them, there's going to be anger and grieving and a lot of it. Now, I think that's the exact problem that Jesus sought to address in his earthly ministry. Next slide, please. Here in the Gospel of John, the author has Jesus addressing his followers. Can you back up one? There we go. Here in the Gospel of John, the author has Jesus addressing his followers who were themselves a minority among Jews. And the first readers of John's Gospel were also Jews who were themselves and expelled people in a conquered land. As you can see, there was plenty of anger and grieving to go around. Now, as a student of the Bible, I used to not like John's Gospel very much. And I didn't like it for the very reasons we're exploring in this sermon series. I thought, it's too mystical. It's too confusing. Perhaps most troubling to me was that when I searched for the inclusivity that I longed for in the church, I instead found only exclusivity. You move me forward one? When I searched for a faith looking out into the world, I found in the Gospel of John only a vision that looked inward. When I searched for the way, I found only a very narrow path. This dichotomy, this tension between the mission inside the walls and the mission outside the wall, this tension, this three-way tension between me and us and them is exacerbated by a portrayal of an exclusive faith that I saw described in the Gospel of John. Now, you know what we're talking about. We've been talking about it here in this sermon series for a couple of weeks ago. Who hasn't seen the sign on the, port on, the uh, on a roadside billboard? There it is. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You've got to drive through the Midwest. You're going to see this sign, I promise you. Or simply a sticker that says, John 14:6. So this is kind of what this whole sermon series is about. And I want to add just this one bit to what we've already seen and been learning about it. If you're feeling alone in the world, and if you need some direction and focus in your life, then John 14.6 can give you a lot of hope, can it? In fact, when I was first beginning my Christian journey, many of my more religious peers suggested that I start with John 14.6. I am the way, the truth, the light. Now to be sure, as I'm approaching the end of my seminary journey, I don't agree that this verse is necessarily a good entry point for new folks. I mean, seeing that on a billboard may not suggest that one should immediately come to Nyanic Community Church to begin their faith journey. 
And I would guess that it's probably not our first choice of verses if we were going to decide together what verse we were going to put on a bulletin board. But this verse is part of our legacy as Christians. It's a revered part of our scriptures. It is perhaps the most well-known verse in the New Testament. And whether we agree or disagree with its sentiment, we must contend with its implications. So I think it's a concept to build upon, not a concept to reject. And that's why we're doing this sermon series. And also why we're looking at the scripture that Kaylee read for us earlier today. Here, we use the allegory of sheep in a fold that know their shepherd's voice. The sheep are protected by the shepherd because the shepherd knows them and will do anything to protect them. And the sheep are protected from the wolves because they know the shepherd's voice and will come when the shepherd calls. And how big is this flock? Is it just us? Just this little flock here in the sanctuary and watching online? Is it just us Christians that know Jesus? Next slide. Well, Jesus says he has many flocks. He says, I have many sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also. I must bring them also. Now to make sense of all this, see what I've talked about John being confusing? <laughs> to make sense of all of this, this is one other aspect of the Gospel of John that I really want us to contend with here, and that comes from its very first words in chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. And the word became flesh and lived among us and we have seen his glory. The glory of as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Taken together, this message that offers hope to the hopeless and light in the darkness in the context of Roman hegemony was seductive and still is. It's as though the text of John 14:6 was chiseled into the stone all over the Roman dominated world and and put up on every billboard from here to Chicago. And the gospel writer knew that. There was a hunger in the empire to know that God cared about people, even if Rome didn't. If Jesus was the word, an enfleshed manifestation of God in the world, and if that word was with God at the moment of creation, then suddenly the story makes sense. All people in all creation are part of God's flock. I must bring them also. My friends, the love of God shines for everyone. Everyone. We started this sermon with a discussion about our closely divided politics, and I think the scripture today has something to say to that. How might our relationships as a congregation or as a nation be changed when we recognize that the light of God illumines all of us? Not as adversaries, but as diverse people of the same flock. How might we approach problem solving when we know that God does not favor us over those in other folds? That is a radical question that I think this scripture challenges us with. And in asking it, we can see the radical nature of the church that Jesus calls us to be. To be sure, Jesus was addressing oppression and bias. He was decrying the oppression of Rome and the bias he saw in the traditional Jewish authorities. But his argument was not that he was right and they were wrong. Not that his way was the only way. 
No. His argument was that we are all children of God. Every one of us. And oppression or bias based on esoteric religious difference is simply wrong. Jesus said, I must bring them also. So what are we to do in this divided land? What are we to do when the majority is so small and the minority so big? Next slide. When every decision leaves a very large portion of us unhappy. There are no easy answers to that. But I think one thing we... I think one thing we can do is to remember that God loves us and loves everyone else, too. When we know that, then we can see our differences in a different light. We can see our differences in God's light. And in that light, we can better see the nature of our disagreements. We can see that some of them are of little actual consequence. And those that are more important can be addressed not with hatred and vitriol, but instead with love and understanding. My friends, I think that is what this scripture is telling us today. We may have differences of opinion, but we are bound together by something far greater. We are all part of the same flock. We are all beloved children of God. Next slide. And we are all called by God to, into the same 4G way. Remember that? We've been talking about that. Love God, love neighbor, love yourself, and share God's grace. And that God, the God of all creation, is the way, the truth, and the light. Not just for me, but for everyone. You know, maybe my peers were right way back then. Perhaps John 14, 6 is a good place to start. But it's only the first step along the way. Praise be to God, my friends. Amen. So I'll just take a moment to take a breath. Let those words from Jeff sink in deep to our hearts and our minds and our spirits. While we do that, I want to share with you, we've got some prayer requests here on the prayer cards. And if you have a prayer request on Zoom, please put it in the chat now, and we'll make sure to lift that up this morning. Ocean has a prayer of thanksgiving for the birth of her great-great-niece, Ella, this week. Oh, celebration and joy. Congratulations, great gone Ella. Ocean. <laughs> Peg is praying for Fred and Jean, who have COVID prayers. There are still people out there who have it, and so we'll pray for them. Ro and Georgie are praying a prayer of thanksgiving for a family visit from South Dakota this week. What a joy. And for their daughter's birthday. Wonderful. Justine is praying for that, or saying, sharing that May 16th is International Peace as We Live Together Day. I love that. It proclaimed by the United Nations, so may we all be in prayer for peace for our world. Linda and her husband are celebrating 60 years married. Linda, where are you? Oh, there you are. Congratulations. And happy anniversary. Um, for all the migrants at the border and for people in the southern states. Absolutely. On Zoom, we've got prayers. Prayer of Thanksgiving for Mickey's life, Kevin's brother. And this is Terry prayers of thanksgiving for good health news for Marge. That's good news. And Mary Child is praying for mothers everywhere. Um, any others on Zoom coming in? I have a tradition at the churches that I've served to share this wonderful prayer for Mother's Day that was originally written by Amy Young and modified by a clergy colleague, Heidi Heath. And 
So if we could just be in an attitude of prayer, and I'll share this with all of you this morning. I want you to know that we pray for you. If you are like Tamar, struggling with infertility or a miscarriage. I want you to know that we pray for you if you are like Rachel, counting the women among your family and friends who year by year and month by month get pregnant while you wait. I want you to know that we pray for you if you are like Naomi and have known the bitter sting of a child's death. I want you to know that we pray for you if you are like Joseph and Benjamin and your mother has died. I want you to know that we pray for you if your relationship with your mom was marked by trauma, abuse, or abandonment, or she just couldn't parent you the way you needed. I want you to know that we pray for you if you've been like Moses' mother and put a child up for adoption, trusting another family to love your child into adulthood. I want you to know that we pray for you if you've been like Pharaoh's daughter, called to love children who are not yours by birth, and thus the mother who brought that child into your life, even if it is complicated. I want you to know that we pray for you if you, like many, are watching or have watched your mother age and disappear into the long goodbye of dementia. I want you to know that we pray for you if you, like Mary, are pregnant for the very first time and waiting breathlessly for the miracle of your first child. I want you to know that we pray for you if your children have turned away from you, painfully closing the door on relationship, leaving you holding your broken heart in your hands. And like Hagar, now you are mothering alone. I want you to know that we pray for you if motherhood is your greatest joy and toughest struggle all rolled into one. I want you to know that we pray for you if you are watching your child battle substance abuse, a public legal situation, mental illness, or another situation which you can merely watch unfold. I want you to know that we pray for you if you, like so many women before you, do not wish to be a mother, are not married, or in so many other ways do not fit into societal norms. I want you to know that we pray for you if you see yourself reflected in all or none of these stories. This Mother's Day, wherever and whoever you are, we walk with you. You are loved. You are seen. You are worthy, and may you know the deep love without end of our big, wild, beautiful God, who is the very best example of a parent that we know. God, we know this day is not easy for many. We know this day can bring hardship and great joy all in one. And God, now we take a moment to lift up the prayers in each one of our hearts silently to you. We lift these prayers up and the prayers in each one of our hearts up to you, O God, in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray when we gathered together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God blesses us so we can be a blessing to others at this time. We'll now invite our ushers to come forward to receive our tithes and offerings. I'll remind you also that we've got a QR code now, and if you don't know what that is, don't worry. Um, on the back of the bulletin so you can donate electronically as well.
and holy God, these gifts have been given out of a spirit of generosity, a spirit of joy, and a spirit of love. 
May you use these gifts to further your work of justice and joy here in this church, in our community, and in our world. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Now remain standing, and contrary to the bulletin, we will not quietly reflect as we sing our closing hymn, but we will loudly sing our closing hymn. I heard the voice of Jesus say, what's different than what's on the screens? What's, hmm, it's a mystery. The bulletin has your lyrics, so you can loudly sing, I heard the voice of Jesus say. <laughs> As you go out into the world from this place today, siblings, I invite you to think about Jesus' love. His love for you, his love for your neighbor, his love for everyone. Such a love transforms arguments. Such a love softens disagreement. Such a love lights the way forward. Such a love is God's wish for us all. And now, my friends, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.